Pakistan possesses some of the wonders of classic Islamic architecture, like the gardens which surround us. Some of the most genuine vernacular traditions, as was amply demonstrated in the exhibitions opened yesterday. And some of the most important contemporary efforts within the Muslim world. It is only fitting that this microcosm of Islamic traditions serve as a host for the contemporary achievements of the whole Muslim world, from the arid shores of the Atlantic Ocean to the tropical splendor of Indonesian islands. Here, better perhaps than anywhere else, the richness and glory of the past and the creations of today can be seen in the context of a vibrant and exciting concern for the environment. For it is indeed this concern that we have come to celebrate. And we must recognize that we are not premiating a country, a city, or a building, but the whole Muslim world as it enters into its 15th century of existence. Humankind has created extraordinary works. The legacy of our ancestors reminds us of the long road we have traveled as a civilization. It makes up our identity and nourishes our pride and dignity as human beings. Dignity emerges when we improve people's lives when we boost healthcare and education programs, when supporting individual and social projects, when favoring women's empowerment, when bringing electricity and water to homes, when rehabilitating cultural heritage or creating green parks in polluted urban areas. Lahore in Pakistan is the setting of significant social and cultural rehabilitation projects, many of them led by the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Thanks to these projects, the old city has been revived, the lives of its inhabitants improved, and episodes of its glorious past given new life. One of the most important was the conquest of Lahore by the first Mughal Emperor Babur in 1524. Since then and for a period of 130 years, Lahore experienced the largest demographic and economic growth in memory. The city became renowned for its opulence, its exuberant palaces and lush gardens, its artisans and vibrant cultural life. It was the capital of the Mughal Empire intermittently during the reigns of Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. Later it would witness a long period of conflict, initially under the rule of the Sikhs and then the British, and finally with the proclamation of independence in 1947. The partition of India and Pakistan was followed by riots, killings, persecutions and massive exodus. We are Eight million Muslims left their homeland to flee to the newly created state of Pakistan, while six million Hindus and Sikhs traveled in the opposite direction. Lahore, disputed by India and Pakistan until the last moment, was the setting of violence and massive arrival of Muslim immigrants, doubling its population at the time. Today, the capital of the Punjab province is a cosmopolitan city with 11 million inhabitants. Some of its main attractions are the Fort Citadel with its royal palaces, walls and gates. The Great Badshahi Mosque beside the fort's walls or the Shalimar Gardens. All of which are exquisite legacies of the Mughals. But its livelier heritage can be found in Lahore's walled city the historic core. Within this relatively small space of 285 hectares, a packed 130 kilometers of bazaars, narrow and tortuous streets and lanes, 
and no less than 22,000 buildings. This area attests to an urban heritage of considerable historic interest and charm and contains several elements of Mughal origin, such as the extraordinary Wazir Khan Mosque. In 2005, the government of Pakistan commissioned a project with the financial participation of the World Bank and the Punjab government to revive the deteriorating walled city. The first phase of the project was completed in 2014 and involved the improvement of local infrastructure services, such as the drinking water supply network and sewage system, as well as urban and architectural rehabilitation that included major monuments from the Mughal period. The Historic Cities program uh, decided to take on the most challenging project, which was the walled city of Lahore itself which, as you are aware, is about 2.5 square kilometers, very densely populated. And uh, working there was a challenge in itself. But, but this goes with the focus of improving lives. And since so many people were living there, 150,000 during the daytime, and doubling to maybe 300,000 you know, by nightfall, evening fall. So working there, improving those lives was the main object. Uh, let me add whether we do a monument or we do a neighborhood or we do a socio-economic appraisal. The whole purpose is how can we improve lives and make it sustainable. The project launched many initiatives aimed at alleviating conditions of poverty and creating new economic opportunities for local residents, whether workers or artisans, entrepreneurs or traders. One of the main streets included in the project crosses the old city from west to east. The Shahi Guzarga Trail was perhaps the ceremonial route that Mughal royalty would have traversed to arrive at the Fort Palace in ancient times. Over the past hundred years, this major street and surrounding urban fabric attracted a great deal of uncontrolled shops and buildings. The rehabilitation project has been focused on improving the quality of architecture and urbanism, but also on reducing the pressure created by overwhelming commerce and construction. Work has been done throughout the entire area, repairing pavements, modernizing the drinking water supply and drain networks, and restoring several abandoned historical houses that were in danger of collapsing. This is the case of this narrow, tiny, tangled street with more than 20 centenarian houses. The best example in this regard is Gali Surjan Singh. We are going to conserve the houses uh, which are not uh, easy to conserve. People don't know how to work on it and people even don't afford. So they are very happy because they are not in this position to move from this area and they are not in this position to conserve their own houses. The walled city of Lahore Authority and the local community participated in the rehabilitation of many old houses. Several of them were classic havelis Mansions that were primarily built by wealthy Sikh and Hindu families in the 19th century by imitating the style of earlier Mughal Havelis and incorporating architectural and decorative elements of Persian, Turkish, Sikh and Hindu influences. 
Havelis are always designed around a central courtyard and contain spacious rooms with colorful galleries and wooden balconies. Some of these Havelis had been abandoned, looted, and even burnt to the ground after the death or departure of their owners, as occurred during the persecution of Sikhs and Hindus after independence. Rehabilitation has come up after breaking down the initial mistrust of locals and real estate speculation. It has been achieved thanks to an intensive social campaign informing neighbors. There is no welcoming attitude. There are very negative rumors. <clears throat> so we started uh, working with the different people. We, uh, we identified focal persons who are, uh, who are willing to work with us. And uh, then we uh, gave them orientation about the project that uh, what are our objectives. And then uh, when we started working with them, we motivated them, we mobilized them. Now people came, come to us and ask us, please sign agreement with us and conserve our house. Once these houses have been rehabilitated, they are returned to their owners or to new community assigned tenants to live in and maintain in good condition. Lahore's architectural heritage is striking. June 2015 saw the completion of a project to conserve the extraordinary 17th century public baths from the Mughal era. The Shahi Hammam, inspired by the tradition of Turkish and Persian baths. This mon monument was previously very hidden. When we restore it, and this, this is uh, transformed into a museum facility. Almost uh, thousands of uh, visitors are visiting this, uh, this uh, site. During conservation work, we trained uh, a lot of uh, uh, skilled persons uh, in the uh, new trade, like uh, the Frisco conservation and uh, uh, the structural stabilization, brickwork. Basically, we trained a lot of uh, skilled persons in the traditional or historical building conservation. After two years of work, its outer walls, entrance rooms, and large halls decorated with stunning floral motif frescoes have all been restored. And its complex yet perfect water supply, heating, and subsequent drainage systems have been revealed. Shahi Hammam is perhaps the last public baths of this type still standing in the Asian subcontinent. Part of another major rehabilitation project began in 2009 with the study of the problems affecting the conservation of the great Wazir Khan Mosque, the most emblematic and popular mosque for the inhabitants of Lahore. It was built from 1634 to 1641 by a Punjabi governor or Wazir during the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan, who in the same period ordered the construction of the Taj Mahal in Agra, the most popular Mughal monument in the world today. The Wazir Khan Mosque was not designed to be a monument as refined as the Taj Mahal, but as a building to occupy a site and serve a key function in the daily lives of the citizens of Lahore. It has a rectangular floor plan with four imposing minarets, a large central courtyard with a fountain and pond for ablutions, and a small tomb, as well as two pavilions and a main prayer hall. It was built by using the artisan, artistic, and decorative elements of the time in the region, such as the kashikari, traditional Persian glazed tile mosaics, paintings of floral motifs, 
and also Mukarnas of Andalusian inspiration crowning the main arches. When this complex restoration project began, it was noticed that not only was it affected by the normal problems associated with the passage of time, but its outer walls had also been damaged by the activity of adjoining shops over the years. The project managers therefore ordered their removal and even had the historical calligrapher's bazaar removed from the reception area of the entrance to the building. The perimeter of the site was also excavated to separate it from street level, as it had risen over the years, and many architectural elements blocking the entrances were removed, once again making the mosque the most striking building to rise above the houses of the walled city. But the rehabilitation of the mosque and the urban fabric around it has not been completed we have to rehabilitate the entire chalk. We have to conserve the mosque, the interior of the mosque, and we have to improve the facilities for the mosque on the south side, which includes ablution spaces, which includes open spaces, and the offices for management of the mosque and the chalk. It's a long, it's a long project, it's about five years' time, but hopefully we'll be achieved. And all of this to be followed by more new projects aimed at reviving the center of the old city. The next phase is uh, these houses, they are facing the chalk and we are rehabilitating these houses, not only the exterior, but the interior also. So those people who were living there, they have been properly compensated, they have been moved out and we are working on the interior, those will be redone and those will be reused for community and tourism related activities. The main facade now fronts a square that is large enough for locals, tourists and the faithful to admire. The restoration of the decorative facade of the Citadel's northwestern wall is another of the most distinctive rehabilitation projects undertaken recently. It is one of the largest murals in the world, measuring 450 meters long by 15 meters high and is richly decorated with outstanding mosaic panels and fresco paintings produced by the best artisans of the Mughal era. The restoration has involved the work of up to 200 people, including architects, restorers and artisans, professionals who have used the project to recover ancestral artisan techniques under the guidance of modern methodologies. Implementing new methodologies of architecture, engineering and design can help to document, interpret and apply the best techniques when facing major restoration challenges. One of the major challenges we faced was uh, the water drainage, which was rerouted during British time when they, they, they conquered this area around 1850s. They rerouted the original Mughal waterways. Originally, the water was collected inwards but after their intervention, water was splashing outwards toward the picture wall. So this was the major cause which destroyed the, uh, the decorative patterns and even the st structure of the, the, the wall was compromised. The restoration and conservation of cultural heritage is crucial for recovering traditional arts and crafts that in many cases had been lost. They are craftsmen who have been working on similar structures and some are, some have inherited this knowledge from their parents, from their grandparents. But the issue is that they don't have a similar work available in the local market. So this project has provided them this opportunity. 
Restoring the bricks, mosaics, paintings, and original filigrees of this wall is part of an ambitious project promoted by the local authorities with the help of the Norwegian government. Its goal is to rehabilitate all the historical palaces and gardens in the Fort Citadel and transform the complex into a major tourist attraction that can generate economic activity, work and jobs, although this very same restoration process has already provided work to hundreds of people. Another wonder rises above the wall at one of the corners of the citadel, the Palace of Mirrors, or Shish Mahal. It is a white marble pavilion, ornately decorated with precious stones and mirror inlays and murals, some of which were damaged and have been replaced by glass mosaics. It was built at the time of Emperor Shah Jahan in the 17th century and was reserved for the use of the imperial family and court receptions. It is a remarkable work of art that exemplifies the refinement of Mughal rulers, displaying the taste and skill of the artisans of the time. The pavilion has fortunately survived, but conserving it is a challenging job for the young architects who dream of continuing to work on the rehabilitation of many more sites in the city. So when, uh, in 2009, when I joined AKCSP, I learned a lot of new skills and a lot of uh, new things. So basically that's when the time when I decided I want to do architecture. And I got admission into National College of Arts. So the main thing got, uh, make, gave me the inspiration was the neighborhoods, the spaces around me, the magical buildings, and uh, you know the community, the living conditions, which were far distinctive from the rest of the Lahore. So that was the main inspiration that I want to do something for my city. The value of historical legacy increases through its rehabilitation, and this increased value generates wealth that has a positive impact on the community. Lahore is home to a vast legacy that is just beginning to be deservedly appreciated. From the testimonies of the pre-Islamic era to the golden age of the Mughal Empire, the inhabitants of Lahore have spectacular fortifications, palaces, mosques, tombs and gardens, such as these by emperors Jahangir and Nur Jahan.
but Lahore also possesses an amazing mixture of past and presence in its streets and daily life. One example of this is a hidden historical treasure, the Mariam Zamani Begum Mosque, which can be found behind an improvised shoe store in a narrow, noisy street. Walking around, history looks to be not far from the present. Meeting past and present, taking care of cultural heritage, brings many benefits. We understand the most important, which directly impact people, individuals, communities, is tangible benefits. But then there are all these other uh, higher levels of uh, benefits, which are more experienced as it were, you know. The pride in architecture, the, the pride in heritage, uh, the hope that comes with it, you know. Like our forefathers could do such great things, why can't we do it? So, so there's this great uh, awareness and recognition of that. These are sustainable, full-time, they employ people. And because of that, the tourism that has increased, you know. From 1947 until today, political life in Pakistan has witnessed periods of instability, military rule, violence and conflicts that slowed down its progress. Today, it is among the nations in the developing world that has made substantial progress in reducing poverty. Pakistan is a very young country that is forgetting the colonial era. Its population currently stands at 220 million people, 35% of whom are under the age of 15. New generations of Pakistanis definitely want to move towards progress, looking for a better future, wishing to restore pride, dignity and hope. Thank you.